Hello, Misfit Nation. This is Dave Lucas, and welcome to another episode of the Misfit Entrepreneur Word. It's our job to help you unleash your inner misfit and break through to higher levels of success, wealth, and fulfillment by bringing you the best insight and information from the world's top entrepreneurs with a specific focus on their misfit side, the specific traits, habits, and secrets that have allowed them to thrive and succeed. As a reminder, if you're new to our channel, hit the subscribe button below, give this video a like and comment as well. We do our best to respond to all comments as soon soon as possible as, as we can. So we'd love to see your comments on this. This week's Misfit Entrepreneur is Mark Schechter. Mark is a former internationally acclaimed producer, writer, and composer. Throughout his incredible career, he's collaborated with legendary figures, including Jim Carrey, Steve Martin, Elton John, Diana Ross, Ella Fitzgerald, Ray Charles, and a number of others. Mark's talents have earned him prestigious accolades, including Emmys, New York Film Critic Awards, and U.S. Parents' Choice Awards. But with all that success, he found a bigger calling and left to fulfill his mission of helping people and businesses learn to innovate and tap into their creativity through his firm, Think8. Mark has pioneered an entirely new system of creative thinking to empower companies, entrepreneurs, and organizations to succeed well beyond their expectations. And he's trained thousands globally and helped create billions of dollars for his clients in doing so. His latest book is titled Think 8, Eight Steps to Ignite Your Creative Genius in Business, Career, and Life. And it's sharing his philosophy and system. So I'm really excited to dig into that with him today and share that with you. So Mark, are you ready to unleash your inner misfit? Totally there, on side, let's rock. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And as we do with every guest that comes on the show, let's just start with your story because you've had a really interesting career and for all intents and purposes, could have stayed in your old career and continued to be super successful, but decided to, to just move on to something else and bring some of what you learned to that as well, too. So it's almost two careers for you at this point. And so take five minutes or so and just tell us, how'd you get to where you're at? Well, once upon a time, I was going to be a lawyer. My family, they're all lawyers, father, brother, sister-in-law, brother-in-law. You know, I went to law school. I was accepted at uh and, you know, in law school, the first week you're talking partnership. The thing is that parallel to that, um, I was writing plays in university, songs, songs were getting recorded on the air and so on. And I thought, well, that's cool. That's fun. But I got to be serious about, you know, growing up. I mean, you know, law, and you're going to have your home and you're going to have your clubs. You know, that was the kind of reality. But uh, what happened in the pivotal moment in my life was uh, uh being in law school on a break, and I looked around and all my buddies were studying Financial Times and Wall Street Journal, and I was looking at TV Guide listings for who was playing and how the shows were doing, and I said, I don't belong here. You know, that was kind of the moment. Mm. And I realized that I really loved writing and I loved composing, so I took the leap, and for 100 bucks a week, I started writing. And I was first with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation saying, you know, I like to write, give me a job, give me a job. And I started apprenticing with them, writing copy, very simple stuff. And very quickly, it caught on because I'd done a lot of writing at summer camps and shows and college, all that kind of stuff, plays and musical work. And I had been into music and they said, OK, let's give the kid a shot. So I started writing and very quickly I got noticed. And within a year or two, I was writing the top shows in Canada and then got scouted by some cool people from LA who went, you know, there's a big Canadian contingent in Hollywood. You're the next big thing. You know, that was over dinner and wine and I felt very, you know, why not? And so they, you know, I went down on my own coin, auditioned for the big network show, got the gig, literally flew down on a Friday, got the gig on a Saturday, flew back on a Sunday, Monday morning, I'm back in LA at work, starting living out of a motel, mm. like this is the life, I guess. And uh, it started. So I was like in my early 20s, 22. And I thought, okay, this is it. So that thing happened really fast for me. I, because of the musical background and the drama and the comedy that I just grown into very naturally, um, I was able to kind of cross paths with all kinds of different artists, like you mentioned, write music here, do some drama there, some comedy here. And very quickly, within a year, I was kind of rising up to one of the top writers in Hollywood and in the country. 
And after three years of that, I was now producing. And I thought, this is amazing. I had my home in the canyon, you know, a gated thing. And another epiphany, I know it sounds ridiculous to say, but I was going to buy a car, right? I had a convertible and I went, what do I buy? My friend has a Rolls Royce. Let me check it out. And then I caught myself and go, I have lost perspective. This is like, am I seriously looking at this? But, you know, when you hit the, when you hit it, it's like that red carpet, you know, if you're doing well in the, in the pink slip, if you're kicked out, the shows were really well, you know, we were hitting 40 million a, a, a week. I was top writer on these shows. I was, you know, very acknowledged and I was still like 23 years old and I was already thinking, well, I'll move to Bel Air and Beverly Hills. And that was kind of like, I've made it. However, something was gnawing at me and I thought, is this it? I know, again, grateful to have that situation, but you talk about a misfit. I I went to my agent and I said, Elliot, um, you know, I think there's something else in life. And he looked at me like, are you nuts? You know, you're sitting at the top five in the country. And I went, I haven't really lived enough to evaluate. And he was like swearing at me. And then he calmed down and he said, I wish I had the guts you had to actually walk out and find something else and compare. So I said, give me three months. I'm going to go and, you know, take a break, travel. I didn't come back for seven years. See, I think I was confused about a sabbatical. This is every seven years. You know, it should it shouldn't be seven years. But I went and traveled and it was pivotal for me, uh, Dave, because that's when I traveled the world. I lived in different countries. I lived on boats, lived in Africa, northern Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, everything studying philosophy, studying religion, studying ideas, living amongst different people, not the Hollywood group, and came to an understanding for me of kind of anchoring. And I went, I think there's something here that I need to explore. When I came back to Hollywood, picked up where I left off and was even more successful, I realized that I had tapped into an understanding of really wanting to give back. I mean, you know, I always had that innately, but so I went, let me study creativity And I went and analyzed um, all the creative projects out there, movies and films and music. And I said, what is this thing? People talk about it. If I could really kind of decode it, wouldn't that be a gift for others? Because I was enjoying the success of it, but I hadn't really decodified how I did it. And I isolated eight points that seemed common to success, rather, you know, kind of... uh, assumptive that I would come up with eight points, but it was eight, wasn't seven, wasn't nine. And I went and tested my theory on shows, analyzed them through that lens, which became Think8. Those that had missed one or two were less successful than those that had innately, intuitively, whatever, over time, actually applied the eight points, started to train, literally come over to the house, have some bagels and cream cheese, have a morning with me, a good breakfast, talked to writers and directors and said, let me, let me try that. How does it work for you? And they went off and started to score more success than before. So I went, well, there's something here that I really have to pay attention to. So that was the beginnings of understanding more than just what was good for me. I was genuinely interested in this give back and, uh, not to be corny about it, it was really an eighth. I had done it through sports. I was a, an athlete, an all-star basketball player and track and all that. And I was always mentoring and tutoring and, you know, just because I'm sure you do the same, just, well, here you are. And yeah. I went, I think I got to look at the bigger picture. So that was kind of the turning point The, you know, upsetting a lot of people that I walked out <laughs> like that. However, I regained them afterwards in a ways I'll describe. But anyway, so that was the origins of it all. So, yeah, and coming in today, I was thinking about this topic around creativity and all the stuff we're going to talk about today, and it's it, it, it's interesting, man. I, I'm I'm going to ask a question, which is going to sound kind of weird, I think, but it, let me explain a little more. So the question that I have is is really what is the state of creativity as you see it today? And the reason I ask that is that we live in a really interesting world when it comes to this because. We have all the tools at our disposal that we don't have to think for most things, right? You know, I can go to chat GPT and ask it a question and get the answer for anything. I don't even have to think, right? But at the same time, we also have all the tools at our disposal to be as creative as probably as we've ever been, right? So it's, it's kind of a weird 
you know, situation where, you know, I think the opportunities are abundant, but the, the, uh, maybe initiative is not what it maybe used to be from a creative standpoint. So I don't know, how do you see it? What, what is the state of creativity kind of with that as a backdrop? Great question. Uh, it's existential, honestly. I think now uh, I'll go right to the AI chat GPT to there's a good example. <laughs> I did a test of this. I had somebody write with our program, just take a look at something and uh, do a chat GPT on analyzing and formulating a structure and a strategy for a company. And I gave the company and we did that. Then uh, and he used the, the AI and sent it to me and said, well, here it is, right? Um, scanned and scoped and s- scraped everything and boom, there it is. Then I went and used mine manually my, without mm-hmm. it, my own kind of initiative and the way I use the system and so on, these eight points and brought what I would call a dynamic blueprint of the solution, compared it to it and it was night and day. I sent it to him and I went, here's yours and here's mine. This is a company, a very successful one and they went night and day unbelievable and i said you know why i said chat gpt takes what exists initiative and creativity individually hasn't been thought yet so what chat gpt does brilliantly is do the whole survey scope what's been done what's available what's out there and you know consolidates it and reshapes it and so on and it's it's very useful in many ways i'm not an enemy of ai at all however Mm -hmm when put to the test, and it was a survey of one, but I've used it with people who have done all of the chat TPTs and AI and are coming to us as our company, our Think A Global Inc. is our company, and they're going, we've done everything. We've got systems, we've got analytics, we've got predictive analytics. We're not turning it over. We come in and manually, I would say algorithmically, you know, mentally without the tools, we have tools obviously and platforms and all that, but not in the AI universe. So my my feeling is on the creative side, there's a step that people don't do, which is very much at the heart of the work when where you start, is allowing yourself permission. I'll use it, it's in the vernacular, we do it in a different way, but in the simple understanding of it is, do you have the confront, the trust in yourself to go there and just think hmm. and just really take a look at what is, what isn't, because the way we operate and where I've always done in show business and it carried over brilliantly, I think is I see what others don't. When, it, when a performer would be in front of me, like a Jim Carrey or a Ray Charles or whatever, what my thing was, and I didn't realize at the time, but in retrospect, they would be doing and people when they wanted to write and create for them would do what is existing. Oh, I'm going to do a medley of his hits. Jim is a good stand up. But did they see the potential that Jim could do sitcom? I got him into sitcom. Mm-hmm. Could they see with Ray Charles that he could actually see through his music? Mm-hmm. And I would design things for him. And basically, the, the, the response was, the default was, what aren't they looking at? So just innately, ChatGPT is looking at what is an available and consolidating, aggregating. What I look at creativity is, if we give ourselves permission to go beyond that and go, what isn't happening with the company? What haven't they looked like? It isn't more of same. And then and, and being able to understand the omitted, which is the harder thing. What mm. aren't they doing? Rather than they could do more of whatever it is. So, well, so that's state of the yeah, union. I think people yeah, get a little lazy on it, frankly. Yeah. Well, so it's a good distinction between like the tools that are out there and the mind that we have. Right. So with that, with that said, then how does somebody truly tap into their creativity and innovative side? Well, this was sort of the breakthrough for me when I, you know, did the work and then eventually wrote the book. And I think it's in one of the early chapters of the book. And it talks about what I realized is, and I came out of an experience sitting with a bunch of writers, top comedy writers, truly top, top, trying to come up with some cool stuff for a special, a TV special, network special, and NBC. And I was the young kid who was brought in, airdropped in by my agent to go, you know, they want fresh thinking, whatever. So I sat there with these gurus, watching them kind of fumble around, pitch each other, smoke cigars, and the whole deal. And I realized after a while, they turned to me, the chairman elect, and said, well, what do you think, kid? You know, called me kid. And I said, well, I don't know what you're doing here. 
And there was silence in the room. And I figured I'm on a Greyhound home, right? And he said, uh, what do you mean? And I said, I don't see there's a purpose here, a real purpose. I don't mean to have a hit, uh, to make money, to draw a paycheck. I mean, what are we doing with these stars? And I realized purpose, a passionate reason to create something beyond the obvious money, whatever it was lacking. They found the purpose of the particular thing. We, I helped them through it intuitively, those early stages. And what happens when you locate or identify your true purpose behind a project or a thing or something that moves you in life, like you've obviously found? The lights go on. So the first step I realized that there is a connection between uh, purpose and unlocking that reservoir of creative and any creativity. It's innate. I have demonstrated time and time again. It's a tenant of the book and the way we operate. People have an innate capacity to create unlimitedly. They find ways to block it or others find ways to block it. Hmm. But it's there. When you, if literally you can come into a room and you can, you've probably been there, you know, these think tanks and they go, let's find a way to do a good project, social responsibility, raising money and give it to hunger, you know, chapters and so on. And they'll kick around, kick around, kick around. And then you say, why are we doing this? What is it that motivates all of us? What is behind you sitting there wanting to do this or another or another? How do we find common ground? The process finds the common ground. Suddenly, the ideas flow. It's quite magical. And that was the startup. So what the eight steps did initially was help somebody unlock it by asking questions that they not normally ask themselves and then finding a pathway to manifest it. And the surprise mm. comes up, and that's why these companies and individuals that we work with do well after the fact is we've enabled them, and it's them. I mean, we're helping them, yeah. but it's them, come up with things that they had never conceived. And they went, oh, I'm thinking differently about it. I hadn't thought about that. And that's the gift of anything that can help somebody really activate yeah, and kind I of think, ignite that capacity. I, th- I think you make a really, really good point about purpose, right? Once once somebody has a purpose, they have a mission uh, effectively, mm-hmm. right? And exactly. once you have a, a direction um, and, and a goal or a mission, then it does, the creativity does come out because you start, you activate your mind to start figuring out how to get there and get it, right? And so exactly. I think coming back to the, the, the purpose, the why behind it of what you're trying to do is if you get, if you can be concrete on that, I, I absolutely can see how, cause I, I can speak from experience, right? The times I've been most creative is where I finally decided on what I wanted to accomplish, the mission that I was going to do and the, in the, you know, kind of the why behind it. And, you know, that you know, everything falls into place. And then you start getting creative. You start, you know, things come out seemingly come out of nowhere, like tools and things you never, they were right there, but you never noticed them before and ideas and things that you can try to, to help grow a business or, you know, drive towards that, that mission or that goal. Right. Um, so in, in some ways, you know, the, the, the old phrase necessity is the mother of invention is, is really, really true when it comes to that. And, and I think that's a good segue into think eight and the, like the eight key factors in that sort of thing. I, I actually, I, I love the name because it reminds me of think and grow rich because it all begins <laughs> in the mind, right? So think truly, eight. Truly. Um, yeah. You talk about an eight step scale, right? And, and these eight key factors that are part of this. So take us through the process of this, explain it, you know, uh, what do we need to know about think eight? Well, uh, as people often say, and some you know successfully would say, start with why or start with how or start mm-hmm. whatever, we start with who. Our focus begins, and it always has been on the individual and his or her capacity to create. If we can unlock that, then we've unlocked everything. And I've sat with the top billionaire CEOs and all of that, because they are our clients, Fortune 500s mm-hmm. and startups. We've launched many. And when we talk to the CEO or the chairman, whatever, and they're having struggled or they want to scale, we always say, well, you know, it's on you because you didn't have the creative solutions to solve it. And they go guilty. In other words, if they could open up their creative capacity, it's an strange accountability. So therefore, the first four steps of the eight step scale have to do with the who. They start with purpose, that motivation, that impassioned desire to create something. Next, right behind it, is the message. When we define message, it is that core belief, that 
commitment, that fundamental principle on which these things are based. For example, if you're talking to a doctor, you can talk to two doctors, one's a surgeon and one is an alternative medicine. And you say to the surgeon, what do you stand for? What is the fundamental truth of what you're doing? And they'll go, people are sick. You got to take the disease out. You say to the other doctor, alternative, what is the fundamental principle, the message you want to convey to people? My cure is prevention. Different core right. messages, right? So that's message. It's not a marketing message. It's a felt deep. I could ask you and say, you know, you do what you do. What is your fundamental belief? Uh, what is it that this whole thing is based on? And you probably mm -hmm. would say there's an infinite capacity to create or you have to go outside the boundaries or you would frame it in a unique way. Right. But it's resting on a truth, a fundamental singular truth, not multiples, derivatives yet. The third thing is, how do you emotionally connect with others? Tone. That's the third step. That is the way you're perceived. And it's good to be conscious of it because it has to be authentic. And what happens often with companies is they ship that responsibility off to a PR firm and say, go create a brand for me. Here's what I do. Go and make it cool. There's, no, there's a disconnect. What is true for you may not be true for them and if they don't know what you're thinking and if they don't see the purpose and the message and how the tone reinforces it then they lose this is the threshold i might have a purpose i might have a message but if i don't communicate it well and i don't connect with people with it and i don't thoughtfully think about this then i can lose i can be a politician with a passionate thing but sound severe you know it just breaks the whole thing the last of the force four is character this is where we get to understand you, whoever you are, broadly, your core beliefs, the qualities that you find dear, your worldview on things. So no matter what you're starting with in purpose, how do you see the world? How do you see your part in it? How do you, it is that kind of authenticity, transparency step that when you have all that aligned, it holds up because you've thought about what moves you, what your core message would be to others, how you want to be perceived emotionally. And there you have what do you think about life? If somebody were to interview you, here we go. You're interviewing me. You're getting a sense of me. If I were to interview and say, what makes you tick? And you've explained some of that to me, and it's very powerful. Now I can put it in context and go, oh, right. that's who I'm dealing with. Now, what are you doing with who you are? The next step, number five, is content. What is it that you're offering? And it isn't just, well, I make toothpaste or I you know, pro provide, say, consulting or I make cars. I'm going, what is it? What value are you bringing with that thing? So we go deeper. It isn't the thing. It's the benefit and the value. What is its worth to others? Some people go, I have an opportunity. I'm going to get this gadget. People will love it. And I go, are you connected with it? Are you feeling, you know, and then they don't do well with it. They pivot, they pivot, they pivot. And they find themselves like there's no connection. There's no emotional involvement. They don't persist because they don't believe it. Too much opportunity out there, not enough personal strategy, in my opinion. But most companies and most people, when they want to fix or scale or grow, will start with content. They move themselves out of the picture and they start with number five. They start also sometimes with number six, which is structure. How are they going to organize their delivery? How are they going to develop what they're doing from the ideation to the delivery and, and the response back? They haven't thought about it or they've thought about it loosely. But how do you structure something if you don't know what you're offering, content, and you don't know the worth of it? And how is that possible if you don't know who you are and why you're doing it and care about it? So the whole thing starts to kind of filter down. Next right. is style, which is the aesthetics, the logo, the look, and whatever. Is this consistent with your tone? Are you manifesting physically? If I came into your space, if I see you online, if I look at your logos and your you know, artfulness, is it consistent with the message you want to put out, the tone you want to deliver? It's important. So now, again, advertiser will go, I think it'd be really cool in black, and we're going to get a really cool fancy thing with jagged this. And you're going, it's not me, but they must know their job because they're pros. We actually are hired by PR and ad companies to be the front end of their offerings to clients because they want to know who that client is before they mess with it. Because otherwise, they're going to run up a lot of hours delivering and the client goes, I don't like the blue. Can you make it green? Can you make, there's no anchor because the client doesn't know who they are. And lastly, and critically so, the bookend of purpose is impact. If you wanted to do this and you're moved to do this, what is the end result? Is the metric of your success? 
look at it and we have found almost without exception that when you ask people that they think small, they go, I want to set the world on fire, but I'm happy with the corner thing and people having coffee. Well, wait a minute. You wanted to set the world on fire and you're thinking, well, I have to be realistic. Oh, realistic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we have a whole front end of the work we do with people called New Think and Old Think, which precedes all of the eight step. But to complete the eight step, you end up with, and you made beautifully, you mentioned it, purpose opens the door. You've experienced that. Right. But what people lack with the tool, and this is where we come in and, and fill this void, is we know the way forward. So that blueprint, by doing all these eight steps, gives someone the opportunity to know the direction and how to now implement there is the outline. There's the architecture. Without that architecture, they can have the passion. They can be motivated and nothing happens. What's the way forward? All of it is aligned. If you have a group of people, they're all seeing the same things and they all get consensus. Yeah, as I hear this too, you know, something I think about, and I, I, when I coach an individual like executive or even work with a, a company, uh, you know, one of the places that I always start with is that, you know, most people – in companies don't get what they want because they don't know what they want. And part exactly. of the reason they don't know is they don't know themselves. And, yeah. you know, it seems like it comes back to know thyself at the very, very beginning. And that's something that in today's world, a lot of people are, they don't take time to do or they're afraid to do in a lot of ways, right? Like when's the last time anybody watching, listening, when's the last time you actually sat down for four or five hours and asked yourself questions about yourself? Like, what do I believe? What do I want? What are my principles? What really matters? Like, and, and really have done that for yourself because it's, and you have to go, you would probably agree, second, third, fourth, fifth level deep to get to the real answers because the first ones are never the right ones. And it's an exercise that if anybody does it, I think can it change a whole life really, you know, because you, you really come out of it like, you know who you are, you know what you're about, you know what you want to do. And then that that translates into the purpose and, and everything from there. It, it sounds like that's the journey that you really are providing through this. And then it builds on itself for the other the other items around a company and stuff too. But I think to me, that's probably the most critical thing that, that I'm hearing you say from all of this. So go, well, go ahead. I think yeah. you've named it, you've named it exactly. That front end, because we, we're in master's programs and MBAs and so on. We're mm. you know, critical to some of these in, in major business schools, and they adopt our material. The reason that I, I, I survey, I actually ask whenever there is a, a post-grad body of, of students from around the world, and I go, in your training, in your curriculums, have you ever been asked just what you're asking? Have you ever stepped back or been instructed to step back and think about why you're even doing the business, why you want to create this or that, or why you are following this path? In all the times in the years I've done it, I've never had an answer ever saying, oh, yeah, that's in our, in our program. I've looked at Yale, Harvard, MIT, even mm -hmm. MIT came to us and said, we can't seem to motivate in our technical training people mm -hmm. to stay with it. And I did a five-minute video, and they loved it the head of their training there uh, in their apprenticeship program. And they said, you finally cracked the code here because it has to do with motivation. You don't have to push it. You simply have to find and tap into that, what you're saying, the purposefulness of it. You know, I think what you, where you sit in and I think where the common reality here is, is people have dreams. Let's just, you know, get really real yeah. about it. I have watched first in show business artists who couldn't make it heartbreak. Um, they were gifted. They were brilliant. I mean, in college, I would see people, you know, writing plays and I went, you're the next, you know, Neil Simon and you're, you know, you're the, you're the coolest. And then, and it never happened for them. And, and, and songwriters and people who had a hit and then they disappeared. And I went, what happened? They were brilliant. Right. And I was very touched by this because I went lost genius. And then I realized they didn't have a tool or they didn't answer some of the questions. And it wasn't about an agent. And it wasn't just about a break. Something innately in them wasn't looked at, by and large. And, you know, it bothered me that other people can't realize their dream. When somebody's going to start a business, they're putting a lot into it. If it's a large company, those executives, and you know this, you run into this, they're sweating it. I haven't met mm -hmm. an executive in a multi-billion dollar company that isn't got, goes home worried every night. I don't care how many saunas and how many golf games <laughs> they play. They're sitting there like this, right? And they hit a plateau 
And you and I would think, what's plateau? You're sitting there, you're drawing seven figures. Who cares, right? They care mm. because it's their job yeah. and what they want to do well. What do we do about those? How do we help them? How do we help the startup? How do we? So, you know, I think we're coming, you know, obviously, you know, you run, you're doing the, you know, Ironman. Where does that fit into your life and, and so forth? And the point you raise is, yes, when we come to companies, we'll often start with the, the head executives or the chairman or the CEO and do what we call life and career architecture. It's the one on one. And then mm-hmm. they do the eight step program and then they bring that aliveness and reorientation and, you know, just reignition, reignition to their company. And that one, two formula is stunning because they're all in, they're fully right. invested. They know who they are, why they are. And it's quite magical. It doesn't happen very often. And that's, if it did happen, regardless of tools they use, it would really elevate a lot of situations. Well, that creates the alignment, right? So, you know, once you know yourself and then tap that into the purpose and tie that into the business, you have that alignment, which things fall into place, kind of like what I was saying earlier. Um, I I guess last question to kind of round this topic out, because I got a few more for you before we get to your Misfit 3. Um, So you you, very eloquently went through the eight different uh, keys of Think 8 in those steps. So if you could, you know, this is going to be hard, but it, you know, there's people watching, listening to this, right? And they're thinking, gosh, that makes so much sense. What is one action step that they could take right now for each of those eight steps that could start making a difference for them? I think the simplest answer is start with what you talked about. Okay. Well, even there's a step before the purpose is they could ask themselves quietly, and we give talks on this actually, about your true value. Um, what is it that they've always dreamed that they'd love to do? That's a very common question. What would you love to do if you could, or you've heard versions of it, if money wasn't an issue, what would you do and mm-hmm. so forth? They're very simple. That's not the scientific approach. We, I mean, we have other questions on it, but that's a general. And then ask yourself, why not? And the question right behind that and this is the, the third question. One, what is it? And the second, why not? And the third is, has anyone in your life in a position of any kind of authority, a teacher, a friend, a coach, family member, suggested, implied, or said that you shouldn't or couldn't do it? Hmm. And what is fascinating is, and I've seen it time and again, person feels that they can't and they just believe it because they feel it's them, you know. But when you ask that anybody ever imply or suggest that you weren't up to it, there's always an answer. So they never look at that question. So Mm -hmm. if they want a first step before any eight step, but it's part of an overall program we do, they might want to look at that. They might want to go, I'd love to do X. Why haven't I done it? And they give their reasons. Well, I got family and money and everything. The usual, usual, usual. You you know the list, right? Mm -hmm. But then ask the next question. When did you think or who said you couldn't or implied you couldn't or shouldn't? Wow. Watch the tears. Watch the face go red. Watch that. Well, if I did it, I'd be out of a relationship. I'd lose my job. I would, you know, and they said and I couldn't. And there's a someone Mm -hmm. or someones. And it doesn't take much. I've seen piano players, because we've been in the arts for years, who stop playing, training to be a concert pianist because their teacher said, you'll never make it as a concert pianist. What are you even <laughs> bothering? Why are you wasting your money on me? Boom, they stop playing. I've seen basketball players. I've seen them all. Guitars, yep. songwriters, certainly in the arts, very visible. More hidden in business. But if you talk to them, because we're dealing with a lot of startups as well, people who want to grow and build or scale a business, you know, and you ask them that question independently over coffee, whatever. It's not the eight step, but it's a it's a conversation piece. You'll always find it. We do start with when we train. By the way, we train people in the tool before we deliver it so they understand the tools. It's a very short process, but they get, oh, I see what we're going to do. And one of the things we deal with is the new think, old think paradigm. And the new think is, of course, anything is possible. The old think is know your limitations. The old think is be realistic. The new think is why? What's real to you is not real to me? Mm. And so on. 
what we're doing is we're eliminating and unpacking all of the assumptions and other opinions and everything. And people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? It's not corny. It's real. It really impacts people. You've run into it. I've run into it. And you have to shake it because there's no reason that I would leave that kind of career and go out and do something that hadn't been done or you do what you do and switch paths Mm -hmm. or a dozen people that I've talked to, dozens, hundreds, frankly, because we run across that who've made that misfit leap, what is the misfit? Isn't it disagreeing with the norm? The outlier, like everybody does this and you're going this way and you're going, why did you go that way? Well, the, yeah. and that's the, the well, the the dirty little secret about this show, and the reason, part of the reason for the name too, is like everyone's a misfit. It's just whether we tap into that side of ourselves or not. Like everybody's got a misfit side, right? Um, in fact, watch your watch your normal executive in a suit and tie at work and stuff show up at his favorite football team's game on a weekend. You know, at yeah. the tailgate, right? That you know, everybody's got <laughs> right. a misfit that that's in them. It's just whether we tap it into business or, or these areas of our lives where we can really you know use it to to help us, right? So the thing that exactly. I I take from from what you just said too, and it it comes back to this so much we talk about on the show is conditioning like and i've always said you know like from the time you're born right you come out with a clean slate it's not like like and you've probably seen this too where and it just use money because it's something that's very emotional and people can relate to but like a lot of people like if i ask 10 different people what a lot of money is to them i'm going to get 10 different answers right Absolutely. And, the, and and the thing that that is interesting of like how those answers came about is it comes about from conditioning that they've had through their lives. And like you mentioned, one of the ways people are conditioned and that's like specific incidents, like a parent or somebody close to you telling you, you can't do that, or you'll never make X or that's too much money or whatever. And these crazy limitations get put on people because of it in their subconscious mind. um, That be just, runs them without even knowing it right and the the ultimate in personal power is when you learn to isolate those things remove them live from true choice and and go out and and you know basically train the subconscious and and you determine what goes into it right but modeling okay. specific incidents you know the um you know what we we are taught effectively through all these influences in our lives from the time we're born you know it's not like you you got out you know you came out of the womb and they're like beautiful baby too bad i'll never make more than thirty five thousand. it doesn't work like that right, right? Um, and, and so, you know, what you're talking about with the old think and the new think is really unpacking and getting rid of the, the sabotage that's been done to their subconscious through these different things over all these years that they don't even realize is holding them back. Right. And so that makes a lot of sense as an underpinning to really everything that we've talked about so far, because it, it goes back to that. Right. So Uh, no, totally. There was a gentleman who was making uh, 500,000 a year. He had a setback, got back into the business that he had left, you know, like a failure or something didn't work out. And he got an opportunity to do the same thing again. And we were talking to him and we said, well, what are you going to charge? And he said, uh, and it was about a two year commitment. And he said, "Mm, $50,000. And we said, why? Well, you know, I'm getting back into the business. I said, weren't you the guy who was making a half a million bucks every year? Yeah, but, but, but again, a conditioning by an experience. Right. We got him up to 250 just on a phone call, and he went and got it. <laughs> and just by talking it out and going, did you lose the ability? Did somebody take an arm off? Or did you have a, <laughs> some operation on your brain? I mean, literally, we got that real with him. Yeah, um, yeah. No, what has changed? Your mind. You thought somehow Mm -hmm. through an experience that you couldn't, never mind somebody else telling you. Obviously, the failure must have come along with some opinions, you know. But there it was. And he and we kept going, hundred thousand, really, 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 you know, just we were on a phone call. So it was kind of cute. We were Mm -hmm. traveling and we went, how about 150? No, okay, how about two? I mean, (laughs) it was literally prompting him and pushing him and saying, 250 sold. It was an auction. (laughs) <laughs> on the phone and he went out and he did the damn thing and he said okay, i got mm-hmm. what i wanted and producer credits and so on and so forth an example in real time took about five minutes yeah now, and it's amazing how 50. much it's amazing how like yeah. 
it's amazing how much this stuff can rule us and, and in some ways how easy it can be to fix once you're aware to it. Awareness is the catalyst to change. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of speaking of that too, um, you know, I'm curious. We talked about Think8. Obviously, this is one answer to this question, but uh, a few other lessons that maybe you found from your experience in the entertainment industry that translated well to your success in, in entrepreneurship. I think the biggest one is trust. You know, the entertainment industry isn't kind hmm. uh, because you're very visible. And when you have success and people like your work, uh, you know it. When they don't, you're out of a job. The thing hmm. is canceled. So how do you go forward? And fundamentally, wake up in the morning if you're on the creative side and realize that you're not going to eat unless you came up with an idea that somebody will want. And then you have to pitch it. And then you have to finance it. And then you have to make it. And then you have to post-produce it to do all the editing and the music. And then you have to distribute it. And then you have to do the accounting. You are an entrepreneur, whether you want to be or not. Right. It takes risk. And I think this is a big conversation worthy of another conversation if we wanted to have one. <laughs> but when people talk to us and go, how did you manage risk? To which my wife and I, and by the way, my wife, Nancy, tried Spotkin. She and I have co-created this and she comes from that same background. So we took the leap together. And she's an Emmy winning writer and shortlist uh, Oscar director and all that. So we had the, the, the success and the chops, right? And people say to us, how did you how do you manage it in the new work you do and in whatever when you're not working for somebody? And I said, You mean how does it feel to be alive? And I don't mean to be cheeky about it. I mean life, risk, like I long ago let risk go. I mm. when I went into show business and when I'm into this like risk, you mean I'm gonna be cautious about choice. And that mm. comes down to trust. So one thing I did learn is you could be hard nosed about. I believe in this, an idea, because it starts with that, certainly in our business, but in anything. I trust it. We back it up with our own methodology, because that helps we iron out a few things. So we use it all the time in everything we move forward with. But we are true to what we feel is critically important. And we go for it. And we've got the naysayers and people who come and go and all that. And we keep the line, keep the line. And have built an amazing business, global, working with people that, you know, growing up, you would have thought impossible. Um, and it's been given us opportunities and even being able to connect with you and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. This wouldn't have happened had we stayed writing music. It's wonderful. Show business is amazing. I've got lots of protégés in it. I've trained people. A lot of, lot of successes. However, it doesn't match. It is in its way, but this kind of thing where we could actually do something for others, and you know this so well, that's the gift of it. Yeah, It's a living and it's a great living, but it's also the gift of it. And mm. it comes down to, at the end of the day, it's you to you, right? Am I going to go right. for this? Am I not? So that carryover was fundamental that I learned from show business. If I could risk that, risk that. Why couldn't I risk this? I mean... And so forth. So, you know. so my last question for you then, before we get to your Misfit Three, kind of it piggybacks a little bit on on that. It, it's you know you've worked with, I mean, icons, right? Creative geniuses, you know, Jim Carrey's of the world, all of that. Was there a few that really stood out to you and made an impact on you? And if so, who and and what 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 did you learn from? What did you take away? Well, I was always fascinated, many are, many are perhaps, on stardom, right? Hmm. And why is this person successful in a hit and why does everybody? What I learned, because as a producer, I was, you know, auditioning and, and contracting people to be on my shows because we did a lot of drama and movies and so on. I've written movie scores and drama series and all that. And you're auditioning and you're looking at talent all the time. Never mind writing for them. Well, you are writing for them. but hmm. And what I found, a couple of things. One... Uh, there are those who are successful, have a hit or whatever, but don't have a follow through because they don't have the craft. 
what I learned probably fundamentally is those that were really knockouts to me were really amazing. You take an Elton John, he could really play the piano. Ray Charles, he could really, really touch soul. I mean, these weren't like light talent. The Stevie Wonders of the world. Um, uh, Steve Martin even is an example, took risk as well. You know, when he was uh, in college, he studied philosophy. And his whole thing about a wild and crazy guy, which I mentioned in my book, is that when he realized at the end of his philosophy, studying Nietzsche and everything, that nothing mattered. That was his conclusion in philosophy. Nothing matters. It's all <laughs> why. And if you look at his first original comedy, he would tell a joke over five minutes and never have a punchline. And people would sit there waiting for the payoff. <laughs> and then they would start laughing to relieve themselves of the tension of no payoff. That was the point that demonstrated. So, but these people thought about it. So the ones that I really admired, and there are many, watching James Taylor writing with him and Carly Simon, watching the, the, the guitar work, sitting and invited to see John Lennon, was an opportunity we shared music, which was an extraordinary thing. Uh, very few get that opportunity. And watching him with the guitar on a voice, in bed at the time with Yoko, it was their peace, love thing that they traveled right. the world with. And watching him and go, I get it. <laughs> that man had the craft and he had the thought. So you can get these one hit wonders. But the ones I really admired, if you sit down at the piano, if you watch them compose, if you watch them arrange, if you see their acting, they have craft. So first and foremost, they have the technical competence. Then they can get the marketing and they hit, but there's a core know-how. And that's something that I hadn't anticipated because I thought, well, a good writer, they hit it, great. But when I sat down in their engineering, in the booths and watching them record voiceovers, whatever, in the show business, they went, well, you play a thing, they got it right away. They would know their lines. They come in fully prepared on the script, 20 pages long, and you'd go, how do they do that? Craft. So yeah. my takeaway was, there's actually something to know, not just a good look and a body and a whole spiel. There's actually craft. And I think that was a big takeaway. And I thought about that. And I wanted to come up with a real know-how and crafted my writing and my whatever. I had the basic skills, but I had to learn and get developed the chops to be able to do that consistently. That was the Mark, big, that's big a, change for me. Yeah, that, that that's an excellent, excellent. Okay, it's time for Mark's Misfit 3. These are the three things that he wants you to take that you can put in your life, your business, make a difference for yourself starting today. And the way that I always frame this to every guest that comes on the show is I say, hey, look, if you were going to leave this earth tomorrow and you could only leave behind your three best pieces of wisdom for the generations that come after you to help them live their best life, what would those three things be? So Mark, what are your Misfit 3? One would be what we talked about, knowing what you want in life, taking the time to actually think about it and name it without care or concern for anybody else. I mean, literally anybody else. You do the service to others when you're true to yourself. It's not a cliche. It's a fact. And you have to know how to disagree with the norm, your misfit idea. So one, name what is real for you and most passionate about, which would be a purposefulness in life, something that would give you meaning. But recognize, as soon as you name it, you're going to feel these considerations come in. So part two is trust yourself. This is personal integrity. Honor yourself. It's hard to do. You know, you talk about honor and being honest and authentic. How about that one? How about saying, this is what I want. This is who I am. I know it doesn't appear that way to you sometimes, and okay, fair enough, or you don't think I should or whatever, but this is true. And the third thing is, Nike said it beautifully, just do it. At least do it part-time. What I tell people when they work with us is, you don't have to leave everything when you switch gears and go off on that risk voyage. You can gradiently build and you can bridge from what you're doing evenings, weekends, an hour a week, some, start, see what it feels like. And I've had so many time and time again, bridge from law to music, from medicine to whatever, you know, banking, 
to you know a sailboating instructor. We, we've seen them all, right? So you want to be able to one name it, two honor it, and three start. Just try it out. See what it feels like. It's quite revelatory when you do that. Mark, excellent Misfit 3. Love that last one too and the way you explained it, right? It's more than just a mm-hmm. slogan. If people do want to learn more about you, where should they go? Well, they're welcome to go. Obviously, the website is the uh, think8globalinstitute.com. Think8 with the number eight. And the other thing is they're welcome. And, you know, thanks to the response when the book came out, it got number one in four categories, self-help, business, entrepreneurship, and uh, creativity. And it's Think8. You mentioned it. And thank you for that. Uh, eight steps to ignite your uh, innate uh, creativity in business, career, and life. It's available on Amazon. It's well-received. It lays out the philosophy, the background, the eight steps, how to use it. It's all there, the case studies. And that is a way easily to connect with what we're talking about if they wish to do so. It's in a Kindle version and it's in the paperback and it gets enjoyed. And it's used globally now in universities and everything. It's an easy entrance into, it's a fun read. I wrote it because it was fun. But I think it'd be very helpful. My intent is yours is how do we how do we help? What can we do materially? And you obviously do it very well. And that's how we do it too. So excellent. We'll go. link to yeah, we'll link to the all that in the show notes uh, so that people can find it. The best show notes in the business for reasons I will talk uh, more in a second. But first, for those of you that are new to this episode with us, you're new to Misfit Entrepreneur, welcome. It is such an honor to have you with us. And if you have an inkling, please take the time, put a comment in below, subscribe to this channel. And uh, I, I hope you become a regular listener, a regular watcher of what we're doing here. And for all of you that are with us week in and week out, I cannot thank you enough for all your support of the show. You are what makes this go in over a hundred countries every single week. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And make sure and go out and check out the show notes for this episode. They are the best in the business. Why? Because I do do them myself. I actually, as part of my personal growth routine, I go back through all these episodes with amazing guests like Mark, and I take my best pieces of wisdom, tips, habits, things that you know I feel can really help you, and then I share those with you. So check those out. And then go out and give this episode a rating and review. Like I said, like and comment on it. Help share Mark's message because we all know, and I say this in every episode, one great episode can change someone's life. Maybe that something that Mark shared today was that missing link you were looking for to get to your next level. So share this with others. And again, Mark, thank you so much for coming on, sharing all your wisdom and insight today. My pleasure. And thank you for the work you do for others. It's quite, quite remarkable, actually.